Oh, we're That's back. Funny, Actually, you know what? I have, don't have headphones on. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> Super unprofessional. It's a me. good way to start. I yeah. know. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome back, everyone. Why headphones on? Because I'm at Pamela's computer and I don't know where everything is. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is really cool. Look at this. All of the, the Scooby Gang is back together. <laughs> Ruh <-roh. laughs> <Ruh -roh. laughs> So, uh, I guess for anyone who has no idea what's actually going on here, uh, this is the Weekly Space Hangout, and this was a, uh, a Google Plus Hangout that we all started uh, about a year ago and uh, ran for about nine months, and once a week we would run through all of the top space and astronomy stories and uh, try and keep everyone up to date on everything spacey that's going on, and then... Uh, it became very complicated and very difficult and uh, too much, too time consuming to hurt all the cats and so we sort of reformulated and mostly just pushed all the responsibility onto Nicole. So she <laughs> happily volunteered to bring it back. She loved it so much. And, uh, and I was with the most rock. And I, I was more, I was, yeah, now that she's, now that she's got her doctor, she's got lots of time. So I want to introduce myself. <laughs> So my name is Fraser Kane, and I am the publisher of Universe Today, and we have collected together the heroes of space and astronomy, uh, my good friends. I'm just going to start uh, left to right. we got Alan Boyle from MSNBC. Howdy. <laughs> With the Vulcan salute. Amy Shearer Title from Vintage Space. Hello. Uh, Dr. Nicole Gallucci, the noisy astronomer from CosmoQuest. Uh, we've got Dr. Pamela Gay, from, also from CosmoQuest, my co-host on uh, Astronomy Cast. And a uh, first time uh, participant, a uh, new guy, Scott Lewis, Everyone? aka the bald astronomer. The and bald of course, astronomer. you know, you probably all know Scott from the virtual star parties. So, right. so the way this works is we're going to uh, run down a bunch of the big space stories and, uh, and then hopefully we'll take a bunch of questions. Uh, either while the stories are going on or afterwards, depending on my uh, capricious whim. Um, and then when we're, uh, and then hopefully you'll sort of be brought up to speed. And so uh, absolutely feel free to comment and ask any questions. Now, you can do that on the Twitters uh, using the hashtag Space Hangout. You can do that on Google Plus, uh, wherever you might be seeing this, uh, this live video. You can do it on the event page if you're watching this on Google Plus. And the last place, and the most reliable place, I'm going to say right now, is over on YouTube. So if you're, you know, you feel like you're you're asking questions and no one's answering, that's probably because we don't see them. Uh, so if you just want to click on the video and that'll take you over to YouTube and you can still watch the live stream on YouTube, that would be that would be great. All right. Well, let's get rolling. So so this week we're going to be talking about uh, plans for an inflatable space station, uh, the return of the Orion uh, mission. Uh, craters on Titan, uh, a supercomputer uh, bolted to a telescope, uh, the uh, work from a high school uh, teacher doing serious work in astronomy, uh, a, an ancient riverbed on Mars, and give you an update on what happened at the American Astronomical Society meeting. So uh, let's start with, uh, with Alan Boyle. Al Alan, you're going to talk uh, about, the, uh, about the update to Orion. Oh yeah, uh, Orion is the big project. Uh, could be 17 or 18 billion dollars that that NASA will be spending between now and 2017 to try to start uh, a new uh, exploration vehicle, the Orion Exploration Vehicle that's supposed to be launched on the Space Launch System. Some people. It wasn't that canceled. Cancelled? Heavens, no! <laughs> no, but every other although, part of it has been cancelled. The, the, the Senate uh, had a big hand in bringing back this big project, and some people call the space launch system the Senate launch system because the Senate wanted to spend so much money on it. Be that as it may, this is NASA's big strategy for going beyond Earth orbit to the vicinity of the moon and to Mars and to a near-Earth asteroid, all these wonderful things that we thought we'd be doing back in... 1990 or so. So uh, the news now is that after a few months of working this out, uh, the European Space Agency is on board uh, literally by uh, agreeing to build the service module. Now if you remember how the Apollo uh, space uh, capsule was built, you had the command module that conical thing and then you had a service module in the back that kind of had the propulsion and all the 
guts that you needed to get people to the moon and back. And so it's similar for the Orion uh, space exploration vehicle as well. You have to have a propulsion module, you have to have something that carries the supplies, uh, all, the, uh, all the gear that won't fit in that conical capsule where the people sit. And uh, so the Europeans are going to do the first uh, go round for that. And that will be ready in time for a 2017 flight that will take an unmanned capsule around the moon and back. And uh, so that will be sweet. Uh, and uh, the issue is that uh, you want to have the Europeans involved. You want to have it kind of be an international uh, effort. And you want to be able to keep the project on track. So this is an aim, the aim of this is just to make sure that they have enough uh, involvement in this project to, to, so that they can hit that 2017 date. Uh, the value of this contribution is, is uh, about $600 million. Uh, and uh, Bill Gerstenmeier, who is in charge of the Human Spaceflight Program for NASA, said that this is not going to lead to a reduction in cost for the rest of the project. This is really just an aim to make sure that they hit their marks and also build on whatever innovation Europe can bring to the table. Europe has become an increasingly important partner in a lot of space projects that where, where perhaps NASA was seen as the only one who could do this. Now the European Space Agency is coming to the fore. So uh, it's, it's just an in indication that uh, they're bringing more people in and trying to keep the project on track and maybe make people aware, like you, Fraser, that it really does exist and they're really aiming to do this. Well, I mean, this was the big promise, right? I mean, when we lost the space shuttle program, the, the you know, on the one hand, it was going to be sad. It was launched, lost. It was purposely canceled. We didn't misplace it. <laughs> when, when we lost in our hearts the, the space shuttle program, uh, the, the promise was that we would be going to the moon and that, you know, that it was all good, that this was, this was a necessary step. And then, you see, we saw all these programs sort of ratchet up and then a lot of things got caught or canceled or, or scaled back, you know, budgets were pushed out, things were delayed. And so, you know, I mean, that's sort of, that's, I guess what I was joking. I feel like we're kind of down to all our hopes and dreams are now resting in the, in the Orion program. And so uh, it's great to see that the Europeans are stepping up and saying, you know, we'll help. Uh, almost to the point that if things kind of get off off foot, maybe the Europeans will be able to pick up this ball and keep running with it. I don't know. Yeah, well, uh, you know, it's possible that SpaceX will be the first one to, to send a probe to the moon. So uh, it's going to be an interesting few years to see how that uh, comes about because it's possible that, that uh, SpaceX with the Falcon Heavy will progress far enough along that someone in Congress is going to say, hey, why don't we uh, just... Uh, do it this way or uh, you know there are all sorts of possibilities ahead you're right that uh, there the aim for the Bush administration was to send people back to uh, the moon by 2020 but they never really gave NASA the money to do that and so that's what the Augustine Commission recognized in in 2009 that uh, it was never going to get done and so that's why you've had all this indecision and going back and forth uh, people said instead of going to the moon let's go to an asteroid now people are starting to say well let's maybe let's go back to the moon first so uh, a lot of things are, so to speak, up in the air. Uh, but uh, the fact that uh, the Europeans are, are on board, maybe the Russians will get on board as well. Uh, hopefully you've got some momentum. But it, it, the Constellation program, uh, the Back to the Moon program that was uh, canceled, uh, is an illustration that you really need to have NASA leadership that uh, if the Europeans and the Russians and maybe even the Chinese someday are able to participate, that's great. But for now, NASA is really the, the leader in trying to get this project uh, to get beyond Earth orbit. And, it, 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 oh, go ahead, Pamela. And, and this is, at a certain degree, the difference between a commercial company that can have centralized goals built on their commercial viability versus an international collaboration of society deciding that it's worth spending our tax dollars. And the one requires international collaboration and the other requires drive and people investing their personal money. And it's going to be interesting to see where things balance out. Is this something where governments end up saying, 
we the people can't do this and individuals say yes we can or is this going to become a matter of society and the commercial industry together reach out to to achieve new worlds Absolutely. Yeah, I'm going to be really interested to see how this all plays out. I mean, as you said, we got SpaceX with the with you know with the Falcon program. Plus, they've got the Dragon capsule. Plus, we've got what NASA is doing. Plus, we've got the Europeans. Plus, we've got the Russians. Plus, we've got the you know so so there's and the Chinese are the wild card. So yeah. I think we're going to the moon. Someone's going to land on the moon, and it's going to happen. You know, in someone one of these time. days. One of these days. <laughs> Ow, someone's going to the moon. Alice. <laughs> All right. Now, now I think you know, and I think this is a beautiful segue. We can talk about about the story that Amy's working on, which is that NASA's working with Bigelow to produce inflatable uh, space station components, spacecraft. I mean, this is a whole other direction that they can go down to. So, Amy, what's the story? Is Amy there? I don't know if Amy can hear me. Are you <laughs> muted, Amy? Amy can, you can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> I gave you a no. beautiful segue there, Amy. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. We can hear you. <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. I'm having network problems. I can't see any of your videos, so I don't oh. actually know what... You're Just a little talk. squarish, but go for it. <laughs> no, we're losing her. Why don't you try uh, rebooting and coming back, and then we'll see. And I lost that beautiful connection from Ryan to Bigelow. Okay, well, then I'm going to move on. <laughs> it was uh, a beautiful transition. Yeah, so so, so then I, we're going to move to something completely different that has nothing to do with space exploration at all, um, which is, uh, Pamela, you've been working on a story about craters on Titan. Well, and, and I'd argue this is all about space exploration because we we live in a solar system that has a certain number of objects that you can't refer to as anything other than a world and one of these is is Saturn's moon Titan this is an object that has rain that has rivers that has active geology and when we look out across the solar system it stands out as being unique in having an, an atmosphere that isn't going to kill you like Venus is but is in fact thick enough that with low enough gravity that were you to uh, put on Prometheus's wings you could fly through the atmosphere and and scientists studying this this world have been trying to make sense of its geology make sense of how quickly is this they keep calling it a planet and I'm trying not to slip up and do the same thing how often is its surface being resurfaced when we look around our own planet Earth we don't see a lot of craters we do see some there's there's um, meteor crater in Arizona you look across Africa Canada these big open spaces have uh, some nicely preserved craters on them but in general we aren't a pox marked world the way Mars or the moon or Mercury are this is because we have wind rushing across the surface carrying uh, dust and dirt and debris because we have rain and because we have tectonics well, with Titan, we're trying to understand, is this a similar process? And recently, a group of scientists have gone through, and they've studied the surface of Titan in detail using radar uh, that is attached to the Cassini mission. So as Cassini flies past Titan on a variety of different orbits, it's been able to slowly but surely build up a nice map of a good portion of, of the surface, especially around the equatorial regions. Now what's neat about the equatorial regions is this is an area of the surface that has what are called sand seas. These are uh, essentially great sand dunes like you might see out in Colorado or you might see in parts of deserts of Asia and Africa. And as they've work to try and study those few craters that do exist on uh, Titan, they've, they've started from the base assumption. Let's, let's assume that the horrible things that have happened to Ganymede, another large moon in the outer solar system, are similar to what horrible things have happened to Titan. And if we start from both these worlds should have similar cratering histories, both should have been hit by a similar distribution of large and small rocks, comets, other debris from space. How do we explain the differences between the way we actually see the two worlds? And what we find when 
we study the craters on Titan is that they show evidence of constant infill, that over time you do start with these beautiful pristine craters. We do find those young, fresh craters on the surface of Titan. But over time, aeolian processes, processes that involve the wind, carry dust, dirt, sand across the surface and at a constant rate are constantly filling in these craters. And so what we're seeing is a planet that's constantly getting wiped away through blowing sand. And there, there's just something kind of beautiful about that imagery of constantly erasing the surface with sand dunes. And, and this is just a neat discovery. Now, there are, of course, caveats. It could be that um, some of the differences between Ganymede and Titan are actually due to differences in the surface that cause craters to form somewhat differently. There could be other processes at play. We do know that there is, of course, uh, fluvial liquid processes on the surface of Titan as well. But it appears to be that the constantly moving sand seas are wiping away the craters. That's really cool. Um, <clears throat> so how, how often is this process probably happening? Like, is it just constantly resurfacing the, it, the world? This, this is, this is a, something that's happening at a constant rate. So it, it's not like uh, there was a time in the past where the sand filled things in faster. There was a time in the past where it filled things in slower. This is just a constantly blowing, moving sand seas, constantly resurfacing this world. I'm I'm imagining I'm working on some science fiction stories in my mind right now. <laughs> when you think about these cool kind of constantly blowing sand seas with giant worms that come out of the sand. Yeah, I think Frank wow. Herbert might have beat you too. Oh, that did he? Okay. Done. All right, all right. <clears throat> but I know also, you know, and this is kind of a little unrelated is there, you know, starting to think that maybe those those lakes on Titan are actually getting like have like ice floating around in them, yes. but like methane, ethane ice. So, so it really is an alien world, and it really needs a sailboat on it. And uh, it, and this is something that many people are hoping that we'll find the funding for. So you know, I'm all for canceling Orion and letting Elon Musk do his thing, so that we can get some more science missions out. There, so. Oh snap! <laughs> uh, NASA, you don't watch this. Whatever you do. <laughs> Um, that's, uh, yeah, no, I think, uh, you know, if we can, if there's one world I would love to see explored more fully, it's going to be Titan. And you get these tantalizing glimpses, right, from, from what Cassini did. I mean, uh, you know, yeah. what Cassini, you know, it's only able to sort of, you know, come past Titan every few months and do some, you know, one pass and do some preliminary investigation. Uh, there's the Huygens Pro, but it just like one drop down and landed, and then that was yeah. that. And so, For Fraser, I was going to say that uh, it's been eight years this week since uh, the Huygens Pro uh, landed on Titan, and uh, there's a new European Space Agency animation that uh, goes through that amazing journey. And so, yeah. if you haven't seen that yet, it's, or, it's a great Go one to take a couple minutes to see. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think you covered it. We covered it. It's uh, it's a wonderful animation and uh, and a wonderful mission. It's definitely one of my one of my favorites. Awesome. Now, Amy, do you have a an internet connection that can be depended on? I don't think so. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> All right. All right. Well, then we're gonna move on. <laughs> unmute self. Unmute can you self. can you hear oh. me? Yeah. We can hear yes, you. We can hear you. Yes. You're good. You're good. Okay, I'm gonna try this, but I have a video lag, so I can't. I can't see. Let me know if if I cut out at all, because I won't know, unfortunately. Sure. This is really frustrating. As it soon looks... as you go live, I lose my internet connection, and I am on Chrome, and I don't have anything else running, so I don't know. Um, but speaking of exploring space with really cool things, there was a news this week that Bigelow Aerospace is sending an inflatable habitat module up to the International Space Station in 2015. So this is pretty cool. This is a NASA got a or it got a 17.8 million dollar contract to build this 3000 pound bubble that is going to go up with a SpaceX cargo mission and attach to the ISS and no word yet on what the crew is going to do with it, but it could be um, you know leased out space to researchers. It could it could be private companies. It could be rich space tourism, which could be really neat. We could have an inflatable space hotel in orbit um, for the Elon Musks of the world, that kind of vacation. Um, made of some kind of... Oh, we're losing Breaking you. Breaking up. 
Yeah, just breaking up, breaking up in orbit. LOS. There's no ionization LOS. though, so I think we're good oh. right now. Oh, yeah. All right. <clears throat> I am did, uh, sharing the Alan, did you did you work on this this story at all this week at all? A little bit. Uh, Amy talked about <clears throat> what they're going to use it for, and uh, and uh, the. Ooh, I'm uh, getting the thinking... warnings. Can you guys still hear me? No. Yeah, no. Alan's. I can Alan's hear you. <laughs> go go ahead, Amy, if you can. No. He's in orbit around no. The... no. Well, I was just going to add. Um, no. Sorry, I just heard a lot of. <laughs> sorry, the the um. Can you still hear me? No. Yes. yes. You can. We have a brief window. Go. Oh, stop. Okay. So, <laughs> so the the brief background to this is that NASA considered the, an inflatable space station the first time in 1959. Um, researchers from NASA's Langley Center proposed a donut, an inflatable donut. I feel like you guys can't hear me. I feel like you're all loud. You can. It's can't all good. <laughs> um, so it was basically an inflatable Taurus, like living, there's the picture, like living inside a donut. And this, this made a lot of sense. It could be folded up and launched in one rocket so that it would be a, a simple one mission to orbit. It would self-deploy and inflate, and it could be... Um, there would be a docking port for Apollo-type shuttles to come in and dock, and this was actually the idea, was that they were going to build uh, an Earth orbital space station to use it as a launch point to missions to the moon and to other planets. Um, and it was, it was actually not, you know, it wasn't out of the realm of possibility. Langley had been doing stuff with inflatables before, and it was, of course, micrometeorites and meteorites were an issue, but the bigger issue was actually and I love this, crews moving so vigorously that they would shoot themselves out the side and through the hole of the, the donut. Um, so that's kind of an interesting problem to have in a space station. Um, the issue with crew movement, too, is that it was very un it was unstable design. It could sort of wobble a lot in orbit and then become very nauseating. Um, so Langley changed it to a, a hexagon shape that was more rigid and could be a little bit more stable. But by then, um, by then it was 1961, and Kennedy said, let's go to the moon, and the space station thing was totally dropped. But inflatables have been something NASA's been wanting to do since before it was NASA. So it's finally doing it, and that's kind of neat. Yeah, and it's a Not great a way donut, to get it. Though. It's a great way to get it started, <laughs> to attach it to the International Space yeah. Station. But I mean, the Bigelow... Yeah. Space Hotel prototype has been in orbit now for a couple of years. I mean, they've they've been testing out this this technology uh, for a little while. So it's so it's interesting that NASA is now taking them up on it and trying to see about attaching it to the space station because that's like what would have made sense in the first place. Yes. As yeah. opposed oh, to the, a, a lot of things that there are a lot of things that would have made sense in the first place that are they're coming back to now and this is one of them so i, I yeah. think that is absolutely the kind of the way we could sort of uh, position this whole thing which is that a lot of really great ideas that have been presented to nasa um would have been great for them to incorporate them early on and now they're kind of sometimes brought kicking and screaming to uh to adopt them and so i think it's yeah. great that they're testing out this so, um, yeah, so, me. so if if all goes well, then when should we will we see this launched and attached to the space station? Uh, 2015. I don't. I, I haven't seen a date yet, but I know SpaceX has a couple of cargo. It's one of the the Dragon SpaceX cargo resupply missions. Um, I'm not sure which one. Uh, there's you know a number of factors at play in terms of when they can get the module done and what SpaceX's launch schedule turns out to be. But um, should be should be in the next you know. Next few years, we'll see people living in a giant space balloon. But imagine the—I mean, just think about the prices for 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 building the various modules on the space station. I mean, you're not getting any one of those for less than a billion dollars. And so, for them to spend what seventeen million, you said? Yeah, seventeen point eight million. I mean, then and what's <clears throat> awesome is that it's just one unit, one launch. Bam, you've got it. Like that would be really cool to be able to just add things one mission at a time, not have to sort of laboriously actually construct things in space. Yeah, I, is, I think it's cool. It's a it's an experiment worth running, and yeah. I think it's going to be it's a great project. And so, you know, kudos to Bigelow and to SpaceX for, I guess, for maybe. You know, offering up such a compelling offer that NASA just couldn't yeah. couldn't resist. Yeah. Great. And of course, the long range applications is to have these little hab that you can send to the moon or send to Mars and take the whole. Yeah, be neat. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. Whew, you made it, Amy. You're safe. Oh, sorry, I'm having <laughs> such issues. I'm going to be quiet for the rest of the day. <laughs>
Um, all right. Well, we're going to move on to Nicole then. And you, so you were working on a story. And I think you you did you gather this at Double AS about? Um, Actually, this is a little bit before Double AS. Is it okay? Yeah, about uh, supercomputers and radio astronomy. My eyes glazed over after that. Oh my god! You guys are so mean to me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I pushed the radio astronomy thing a little too hard, but it's okay. Uh, so the Atacama Large Millimeter Array is a telescope that's being built in uh, in the Atacama Desert in Chile, uh, one of the highest driest sites in the world, and they. They just put the correlator online. So the correlator is this crazy big supercomputer, which I will I will screen share a picture of. Um, and so actually, a friend of mine, Allison Peck, who is an astronomer at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, uh, shared this picture on Facebook, and I was just like, "Wow, look at the blinky lights!" Um, so <laughs> I've never seen the whole correlator put together. Uh, so this was, um, a lot of this was put together in Charlottesville, Virginia, where I did my graduate work. And so I was in the building right across the street. And I used to go visit because I, I would take ex make excuses to go visit and see all the blinking lights and all of the cables that they had to connect. Um, but basically, this supercomputer connects the um, uh, 64 antennas at a time, 64 antennas of the array, and, and brings all the signals together so that it can work like one big telescope. Um, and that gives it the, the really high resolution uh, that, that it's going to have. And so they've already, actually, at AAS, they released, or around the time of AAS, the uh, American Astronomical Society meeting, they released uh, some of the, some first results from the first year of science with ALMA. And it's really cool because they've been working with, you know, a partial correlator and something like, you know, 17 to 20 antennas, and already they're getting amazing science results, and they haven't even finished uh, completing the array yet. Um, so they're seeing streams of matter in protoplanetary disks. Uh, they're looking at, at, star, at star formation in really early galaxies, early in, in the universe. Um, so it's doing some pretty amazing things. And this correlator is the, the, um, the brain. It's not a very smart brain. It kind of does one task. It mixes all, mixes all the signals together. Um, but it does that one task really well. And, and it may be, um, from, from my work with, with correlators, it may be one of the last of its kind that's huge and super big and has all these wired connections in the back because new correlator technology is moving towards uh, different kind of circuit boards that don't require as many connections and software correlators, which uh, it's all done in code. It's not actually uh, wired up quite the same. So this might be the last of its kind as far as the behemoth correlators go. So uh, keep watching the news out of Alma. Now, I might be speaking nonsense, so please stop me at any point here if I, you know, if I am not making any sense. But, but I mean, the trick with radio astronomy, right, is that, mm -hmm. you know, the wavelengths are so long that you can gather together um, signals from a whole bunch of different telescopes which are separated, and then you can then line up those signals and you can merge them together using one of these one of these super supercomputers. Right. And this is something that's very difficult to do as the wavelengths get shorter as you move through infrared and into visible light. Uh, you're not able to do that. You just can't line up the wavelengths. You can't do this interfer interferometry the way you can with radio. So it's like one of the sciences, one of the fields of astronomy that that you really have this advantage that you can set up these big radio telescopes around the whole world and then gather lots of data and then fire it through a supercomputer and it acts as if you've got one great big telescope that is the size of where all the telescopes were. Right, right. One big I did that right? Thanks, Pamela. Yes, one big telescope <laughs> right. with a bunch of holes in it. it, it you yes. Know. But uh, yeah, it, it, it essentially works like that. And, and with, with radio waves, you can digitize the signal um, at right at the right at the uh, receiver now, and so you send digitized signals down fiber optics, and it's a lot easier um, than optical signals. There are optical interferometers that is like black magic ninja stuff because it's yeah. so much and it's physically changing the path lengths to get things to match. Right. Whereas with radio, you, you record the data, way. you put it into a big machine at some place like Haystack Observatory, and out comes your stuff if the times are right, and if the times are wrong, you curse it, it's, it's often, you, I don't know, when I did this, we were always cursing the Russians, um, but that was in 1991, right. so you, you curse whoever's clocks are off, and you digitally move their stuff around, with, yes. with optical light, you can't digitally move it around, you have to physically change right. the path line. And, and when you were we got one out there. When you were at Haystack, and when I was at Haystack, this is a radio observatory in um, New Hampshire. No, Massachusetts. Sorry, Massachusetts. Sorry, I lived in New Hampshire across the border, <laughs> um, in Massachusetts, and um, they had big 
reel-to-reel tape drives that they mailed from every telescope in the array to that central location and read it off the tapes. Now they yeah. use hard disks. They use hard drives. Um, but yeah, it, it has progressed even from when I was a summer student. Cool. Um, I always like supercomputers used for astronomy. Um, all right, well, let's move on. So, Scott, now you apparently, uh, even high school astronomy, even high school teachers can do astronomy as well. Actually, everybody can do astronomy. Everybody can do astronomy. Everybody can do astronomy. And I think that's the, the, the biggest point of this is with the, there's a lot of Hubble data that's out there. And so people can go through the archives of the Space Telescope Science Institute over in Maryland, um, yeah, over in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. So it's his name is Josh Lake, and he was going through this data. He is a, a high school astronomy teacher out of Connecticut, and he was going through this data, and he found a stellar nursery inside the Large Magellanic Cloud. And I'm just going to share the, the photo because it made the, the number one for, the, for Hubble, and it's gorgeous because I like pretty pictures. Who doesn't like pretty pictures? Wow. And so, yeah, you, know, you can see there's that the, the dust lane. This is over in the Large Magellanic Cloud, which unfortunately we don't get to see here in the United in the United States. Our Southern Hemisphere friends get to, but it, it's it's amazing, and it shows the opportunities that all of us have by being able to go through the images and, and all the data there through Hubble, and that the you know we have many new exciting missions going on. But even if you aren't, you, if you haven't you know gone through the eight to ten years of of training to be an astronomer, you can still participate in the science, um, being a citizen scientist. And there's so many different opportunities around that are out there. So this is something that um, that went up, I think, you know, on the 17th. Um, for the Hubble photo, and then also the folks over at Hubble made a video tour of the Large Magellanic Cloud, zooming in on um, on Mr. Lake's photo, which I think is really awesome, highlighting the fact that everybody has the ability to participate in our science of astronomy, and they can be featured in showing up what the amazing things that people can do with it. Yeah, we get a lot of that question to Astronomy Cast. People are like. I love astronomy, but I do I really need to go and take fifteen years of of you know no. of school to be able to do it. And what we often recommend that people do is if like you love computers, there's lots and lots of jobs in computers and lots of astronomers really need help with people who know how to use computers. And so a lot of, of what astronomy is these days is just data crunching. You just go and grind your way through the Sloan Digital Sky Survey or the stuff with from Hubble and and looking for, you know, various, you know, candidate images or various different kinds of objects. And so you can produce this. And so if you're a whiz with databases and you're a whiz with running you know, big, you know how to use a supercomputer, then, um, you know, there's a lot of, of value to that. And you can always be a uh, computer programmer and, you know, work in the software industry as well where there's, there's a lot of jobs. So, right. so we often, you know, if people have computer skills, there's tons of this stuff to be discovered. People, we hear people discovering asteroids all the time, people doing work on quasars. There's so much stuff that's already just sitting in these huge online databases and, and more of them are coming all the time. Right, and this is from the, the Hubble Legacy Archive, which is up at the Space Telescope Science Institute. And so you can go to stsi.edu to find it, and you can even search for images. So you can actually go combing through photos and through images coming up, um, coming down from Hubble there, too. So there are many different databases where the general public can be actively involved in finding new things and make discoveries while we are pushing... The, the new technology out as well. There's still a lot of really good um, data out there for us to continue to understand the universe with. That's really cool. Okay, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna just share a really quick story and a picture. And I'm, I'm gonna have trouble doing this all at the same time. Do you have a copy of the of this river on 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 Mars, Nicole? Yes, I do. Okay, great. Well, then I don't have to find the picture. Um, so, so right. So so uh, the. Uh, the European Space Agency's Mars Express uh, has sort of revealed an, a region on on Mars called the uh, is it Ruel Valles, Ruel Valles, um, and so they found what really looks like a river, and so this this feature is about fifteen hundred kilometers long. It's about six to no, it's about um, yeah, about six to ten kilometers wide, and in places it's about a hundred to six hundred meters deep, and it, it's flowing in this. In this region, and it looks like it was probably formed about three and a half, 
to 1.8 billion um, years ago. So, uh, you know, and there's lots of other possibilities on, on what this could be. Like maybe it's like a lava tube or a collapsed lava tube or glacial flow. But, but a lot of the, you know, the planetary geologists really feel like it would look very different if, if, if that's what it was. So, um, you know, and so the question then is, you know, did this feature in, it, it form really quickly? Like sometimes you get situations here on Earth where you might have like a, like you have an inland sea and then it somehow gets, you know, some part of it gets drained out and the whole thing flows out in a very short period of time. Or did it take a long time to, to, to ha you know, happen in phases? But, uh, but yeah, so it just gives a lot more evidence possibly that there was a time on Mars in the, you know, fairly recent past, uh, 1, 1. 1.8 billion uh, years ago that that there was water flowing on the surface of Mars. I think that was really quite a neat picture and that just came out just a, just a couple of days ago. Um, so I think we've got uh, we've got one last thing. Nicole, you were going to uh, just give a bit of an update on, on some interesting stuff that happened at AAS. Yeah, well actually uh, Pamela Scott and I were all at the American Astronomical Society meeting. Um, so I'm sure if you have been following, there was a hashtag. It was uh, AAS221. There were lots and lots of stories. Um, there was a, a mix of tweets. Some were from uh, the, the press conferences and some were from the scientists. And, and some from the scientists are full of jargon and, and acronyms. And we, we apologize for that, but uh, part of it is that we can communicate with each other too. So we apologize for, for all the confusing acronyms in our tweets. Um, but uh, there were lots of exoplanet stories. Uh, we were there as part of CosmoQuest. We had a booth set up and hung out at the NASA wall. And uh, do you guys have anything else? Oh, what I, I did a little video project. I'll share the YouTube link in on the event page. Um, but since uh, there's a lot of science that goes on at this meeting that uh, doesn't make it to the press conferences necessarily, I went around and interviewed a bunch of people by their posters, uh, mostly students actually, uh, undergrad and grad students. And so I have a video of uh, students talking about their science, talking about their posters from the AAS meeting. And so I'll be posting a link to that and it'll be on the Astrosphere slash CosmoQuest YouTube page as well. And, and I think the most important thing to come out of the meeting was Exoplanets are the thing that is changing scientifically. Our understanding is changing uh, most rapidly. So the meeting right. basically turned into a giant professional development on what are our current understandings of exoplanets. And it's kind of sad when, like me, you're, you're not an exoplanets person and you want to catch up on other fields too. But... Right now, we live in the age of exoplanet discovery. Yeah, I had a great time at the uh, Epic of Reionization talks, so <laughs> I found my science. <laughs> well, and it was really exciting, too, because we even had on, on our, the Thursday, we had what was called a hack day, where people from different uh, the different skill sets that are th throughout astronomy and that are learning about exoplanets or galaxy clusters, we all came together just to create something new together, to collaborate just yeah. because we could. And a lot of really cool things came out of it, uh, one being uh, Nicole's video. But, I mean, they're just going through with the Worldwide Telescope Program and just trying to find new ways of more efficiently doing our jobs, but also finding better tools for the public to be able to find what cool information is being put out there. Um, so we've got a couple of questions that, that came in that I thought we would uh, we'd jump on <clears throat> from uh, from viewers. So one, this comes from Robert Scott Herrick. Are there any ideas being floated around for exploring lava tubes? And so I guess this is you know partly about the lava tubes that were or the collapsed um, lava tubes that we're seeing on Mars and also on on the Moon. And I mean these are fantastic places that potentially you know you could send astronauts to protect them from the the horrible space radiation. I don't know, Alan. Have you heard of any plans for for further exploration of these? Uh, I, I've written about those lava tubes. They're fascinating, you know, uh, have a lot of implications for the potential of finding life. It might be a shelter for some sort of organisms that are subsurface, or it could be a potential shelter for the first astronauts to who uh, settle on moon or the moon or Mars. But I haven't heard that uh, there are any missions that specifically target those. Maybe some of the other folks on the panel have. Uh, it, I think it's just too early, but there are definitely tasty targets to look at when you see the pictures. Yeah, I've seen like, you know, ideas about like spider, jumping spider robots and things like that that you could deploy on the surface and they could 
you know. Oh yeah, jump or hedgehog rovers. People talk about different yeah. rovers that are able to kind of jump around the surface and 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 look into that. And actually, mm -hmm. there was a student team that designed a uh, moon habitat that uh, was meant to take advantage of lava tubes, but uh, or those uh, those holes that kind of go sinkholes that go down beneath the surface but uh, as far as uh, serious missions I, I think it's just too early to, uh, but certainly those would be cool targets for those sorts of specialized rovers. Uh, so Jeff Borst asked uh, can you explain what programs are needed and knowledge needed to crunch the Hubble data so you know let's say that a person wanted to uh, take up that challenge and apply their computer skills to uh, to helping with astronomy what kinds of, of things would they need to know how to do? Pamela, as, as a coder? It's, well, so, so in this case, the, the big deal is you go, you download all of the data and trying to understand the ever-changing graphical user interface to getting the Hubble data is, it, it's one of those things like trying to learn how to shop on a site that doesn't want to let you buy their materials. Um, but once you get your data out, uh, the Python, uh, there's astronomy Python libraries that you can use to reduce the data and get science out of them. There's also software called IRAF, which will make you yell and scream and cry, but it's free. There's software called IDL, which is a set of commercial image processing libraries that cost a small fortune but make you cry less than IRAF. And, and it's through some combination of these different computing languages that we transform these images into science. I should warn you, though, a lot of these things are written by astronomers who were primarily yes. non-coders. Uh, unlike Pamela, most of the rest of us have just kind of hacked our way through it. And so astronomy software, though often free, is, is uh, oh, learning curve. <laughs> yeah, and yes. we are going to be working with CosmoQuest. This is part of Scott Lewis's summer job uh, to start writing documentation on how to get all of this data out. And we're going to be doing it in a wiki so that as the... Right. Uh, content updates, uh, we'll be able to keep our documentation, our codex updated. We should do a hackathon and like have someone like have a research paper done by the end of the day. Yeah, no. <laughs> okay, you first and then we'll follow suit. No, no, right. I just, I yeah. come up with the ideas. Um, <laughs> all right. so, uh, Adam Waller asks, uh, is this something that can be farmed out like citizen science? And I guess he was talking yes. about the, uh, well, but he was actually talking, talking about, about the about the correlator, yeah. Right. So, you know, oh. things like SETI at home and, and things like that, is there a way that people can participate their spare CPU cycles to contribute to reducing uh, radio astronomy data? This starts to get oh, into I the wish. proprietary period for data. So astronomy data uh, comes off the system, and then the scientists who fought tooth and nail to get the money and the time on the telescope have six months to get first hack at reducing the data. About a year for NRA telescopes usually. Right, so it depends on which mission, what, yeah. what telescope you're dealing with. Six months to two years um, is, is your proprietary period where you are the only one who has access to the data. Um, there are a few exemptions to that, the large... Goodbye, oh, Pamela. She the dropped large out. Wow. The large... And you will never know. I don't yes. even know where she was going. But, okay, I think I know where she was going. And the point is that so you, so you 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 have you 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 have to have that data protected in some way for that period of time. So you can get your research paper done and out before everybody else jumps on the stuff you spent money and time proposing to do. Um, but there's another problem in that a lot of this a lot of these correlators require specialized hardware um, in order to to do the crunching. There are so such things as software correlators, um, which, like I said, are just like hard drives. But um, as far as I know now, that the um, the one that the main one that's in use can't take that many antennas. It, it only takes about like 10 to 13 antennas in the VLBA. Um, and so there's not a lot of demand for that particular type of correlator, whereas the rest of them do require specialized hardware, uh, field programmable gate arrays, if anyone's ever played with those. Um, and so you, you, do, you can't just do it on a home machine. Right. Although right now I am working to compile a, a, an archive place where you can find many different citizen science projects, whether it be using you know, a program like Boink on your home computer, which utilizes your CPU and GPU, but also things where you are manually going through data, um, like on CosmoQuest, where you can actually go through images and, uh, and mark features and creators on it. So we're trying to get something 
together where there is one resource where you can find different types of citizen science projects to go to. Um, and then one last question from uh, Yelmerk, uh, and this is this is sort of back to the exoplanets. Um, this was on Twitter. Any idea why the number of exoplanet confirmations dropped in 2012 by 30 percent from 2011? So he, uh, this person is saying there was 189 in 2011 and 135 in 2012. Are you? It has to do with the, the probability rate of finding new things in Kepler. So they're looking at a single field for a number of years, and there's going to be a peak in when they find new things looking at these specific stars, and then a slow tail as they're able to get things with longer and longer orbits. So what we've already seen is that peak in ma maximum number of objects being discovered as we found all the inner orbits and all of the massive objects, and and now we're looking at a slow tail. Once we move on to a new field with a new telescope, then we'll have a new peak. But uh, when you're only looking at one place, you're going to first find the easy to find and then slowly find the slow and hard to find. That makes sense. Yeah, but, but I, I mean, the slow and hard to find, these are going to be the precious jewels, the ones these that we're about to start. These are going to be Earth-like, the yeah. Mars-like. <laughs> this is what we want. Hey, Fraser, I wanted to follow up on that question about caves and, and skylights. It turns out that there was a NIAC report, uh, Advanced Technologies program that NASA has, and Red Whitaker, who is in charge of the Astrobotic Robotic Program, put together a paper along with his team about a proposed mission called Spelunker uh, that would make... Uh, Make use of a type of rover called Cave Hoppers to. Yeah, that's what I was talking things. about. Yeah, the yeah. Cave Hoppers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I can put a link to that. You've probably seen that already, but just to answer that, I'll put that in the YouTube. I love the NIAC reports. If I ever like not sure what to write on, I just go and delve into the NIAC reports, and and I always find something super interesting to to work on. I'm um, gonna have to beat you to it. <laughs> no, it's a race. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. Well, I think why don't we why don't we wrap this up now? So thanks everybody for for joining us. Thanks for watching us. Now, Alan, if people want to find out more, Alan Boyle, where do we find you? The easy thing to do is cosmiclog.com. You can also go to space.msnbc.com. There you go. Right on. Amy, share a title. Your your words are everywhere. Where they, do they are, find you? and um, yes, unfortunately, all of my words are garbled today. I'm really sorry about that, everyone. Um, I, I'm at Discovery News and Motherboard, and on Twitter, um, you can go to amysharetitle.com or just Google Vintage Space and find my blog, and you can usually get to all kinds of fun history from there. Yay! Very cool. Excellent. All right, uh, Nicole, where do we find more Nicole? Everywhere on the internet. No, I um, I work for CosmoQuest. I go to CosmoQuest.org. I also have uh, NoisyAstronomer.com, which links to all the things I write. And Dr. Pamela Gay? I am also over at CosmoQuest.org. You can also find me at StarStrider.com and, of course, AstronomyCast, where you and I produce our weekly podcasts. And we, we recorded three podcasts when we were on the uh, cruise and so they're going to be coming into the stream. We did a we did a new episode on Monday, and there's another one. There's like five episodes in editing right now. So wow. we apologize to everyone who's waiting. They're they're coming. They're coming. Um, <clears throat> and Scott, where do we find more Scott? I am also at CosmoQuest. So CosmoQuest.org. I manage the forum over there. I have my personal website of knowthecosmos.com, and you can find me on Google Plus on Twitter. I am the bald astronomer. Um, and we're going to be uh, hanging out on Sunday night for the virtual star party. Yep, absolutely. And we will be at South by Southwest in March. Oh, right on. And we're going to be at Science Online in yeah. uh, end of January, so just in yes. two weeks. Yeah. I get to give Amy a hug. So I get to meet you guys. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, we will all miss Alan, because I think, no, Scott won't be there. So the, the middle of four of us. Yes. Alan, you're not going to be at Science Online? Yeah, I will. Yeah. Oh, oh. I'll stay alone then. Bye. Yeah. I'll, I'll yeah. run the internet while you're gone. <laughs> if you would, if you'd be so kind, that would be great. All right. Well, so thanks everybody for for watching. And and as I said, the next thing we're going to do is on Sunday night we'll be doing our virtual star party, which is going to be at uh, you know when it gets dark on the west coast around six o'clock or so, and uh, we'll hook up a bunch of telescopes uh, live into a Google Plus Hangout and. Uh, take requests and show you the night sky. So so thanks everybody and we will see you all next week. And thanks everybody for joining on the weekly space hangout and bringing her back. Trying great. To and thanks <laughs> and thanks Nicole for <clears throat> for carrying the torch and keeping it keeping it happen. So that was great.
right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you all next week. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.